Imagine what it must be like for seniors living in nursing homes, especially during this COVID pandemic season. You can be a blessing to them. The CCC Nursing Home Ministry would like to invite you to take part as we enter our third month of distributing pen pal cards for the residents of East Lake Arbor and Briarwood Nursing Home facilities. The residents who cannot receive visitors will receive a card in which you write thoughtful, encouraging words and scriptures. You can drop your cards in the church mailbox outside the office. Print legibly and please do not seal your envelopes. Remember to add pastors and the church's name in the card. There'll also be a pen pal drive through day where Minister Herbert and Flo Harris will be in the church parking lot on December 12th to receive your cards till 12 noon. You can also drop off donations of warm, colorful socks for the seniors as well when you drop off your cards. Let's be a blessing to the residents of the nursing homes, especially during this upcoming holiday season. Pastor Walker's messages can now be heard on 105.5 FM, Sundays at 12 noon. Thanks to all who donated to this effort to get his teachings back on the airwaves. Your Herbert Shaw Jr. Foundation 2021 calendar is available now for a donation of at least $10. Your donation support allows the Herbert Shaw Jr. Foundation to provide scholarships to college-bound high school students. For more information, text or call Arlena Poo at 770-634-1954. Thank you for your generous support. So while mothers and fathers are behind bars, Kids are left behind, families torn apart. This calls for churches across America to rise up and deliver gifts to children on behalf of parents in prison. You and your church become the hands and feet of Jesus. You deliver God's love and bring hope to those who need it most. It starts with a gift. It starts with you. This Christmas, change the life of a child forever. This year, the Angel Tree Gift Giving has gone virtual. Be on the lookout for your CCC email blast for the link to log into our Angel Tree page and type in the security code provided. Please visit the site and bless a child and their family before December 10th. Again, if you're not receiving our CCC emails, please contact the church office at care at cccleithonia.org.
Last week, it was really a surprise to us. I was all prepared to minister, and I started seeing things moving around, and I was really not knowing what was going on, and come to find that some planning had been taking place behind the scenes to celebrate our 40th year, our 40th anniversary, and uh, honoring uh, me and Francine and our family. So I so appreciate each and every one of you that part of the planning and and participated, you gave, and the letters, we read the letters, they were so heart-rendering uh, or moving. 
that we said we read each one of them and I tell you we had our moments as we read those letters because they were really we could just sense the heart of those that wrote them so I just want to thank you again I am so proud and so happy to be your pastor this is really an honor God has allowed me to pastor you for over 40 years and uh, to look back and that's what we're doing in retrospect to just reflect upon how uh, how gracious and merciful God has been to us to allow us to do ministry or be involved in ministry and to care for your souls. So God bless you, and I pray that God would just continue to uh, Im, uh, impart to me what you need so that as I minister the word to you that you are enriched through the messages that God has given me to give to you and also through the ministry that God has given me to give to you. Uh, we have a lot going on during this time of the pandemic, and many have been challenged, but at the same time, we are celebrating God's goodness. He is good to us. Many of our members, some of our members, who I was just coming into the sanctuary thinking about some of the members that have transitioned, and I'm thinking, what would it be like when we come back in together and don't see their faces and see them sitting in the places that they were sitting beforehand? But at the same time, we know that they're in the presence of the Lord, rejoicing in his presence. So we praise God for that as well. And, and Sister Pat has one of my favorite songs that she sang when she would minister that song. It, it is uh, one of my favorites. So let's get into the word of God. This is the day after, this is the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Trust you had a, a wonderful Thanksgiving uh, time together with your families. It was a little different because we were having to uh, stay with our individual families and not with the family at large as we normally do. But it was still a very, uh, I would say, intimate time. And I trust that each of you had the same within your households as well. So Father, we pray that even as your word goes forth, that it will take root within the hearts of those that hear let it be more than words, but let it be your word imparted into the hearts of those that have gathered together this Sunday morning. We give you the honor, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. been ministering on uh, love for the most part, and, and I believe that uh, of all times, God has really began to, I, I would say, impress that upon my heart to understand the love of God as, as Father, and to understand the love of the Son. And in this, I'm going to minister, and I call this, I'm going to just read the scripture out of John chapter 14, verse 8, because the title I'm giving this is Seeing God as Father. Seeing God, seeing him as Father. He is the Father of those of us who have received the Son. But to see him as Father is something that I want to emphasize this morning. So let's turn our attention to John chapter 14, verse 8, that one particular passage of Scripture where it says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Let me read it again. Philip said to Jesus, Philip was speaking to Christ, and he said, Lord, show us the Father, reveal to us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Reveal the Father to us. Now, this was a preface. This was prefaced by him saying something before he got to the point of asking Jesus to reveal the Father to him. And we go back to John chapter 1, verse 4. I'm focusing primarily upon that particular passage on the eighth verse of the 14th chapter, but in order to bring it into proper context, we've got to go back to verse 1. So let's look at the scene that was there at that particular time. It was Jesus Christ getting ready to depart. He was preparing his disciples for his departure. And he said to them in the first verse, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, 
there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now, let's look at, let's take our time and look at what he is saying. The, he, he says here, let not your heart be troubled, which uh, suggests the fact that his departure would cause them to have troubled hearts. But then he began to let them know what he was going to do. He says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. In my father's house. In other words, in my father's, we look at this word house, we, look, we have our word economy. In my father's economy, there are many, and look at the word, it said mansions, there are many dwelling places. In my father's economy, there are many dwelling places or places to dwell. Now, we talk about places to, to dwell. It is really saying, in my father's economy, there's a place where you fit in perfectly. There's a place for you to fit in, and not just to visit, but to abide there. In other words, there's a resting place for you. There is a place of abode that, has, that is established within God's economy. Now, we got to understand what God, what is being said in Scripture here. He is saying that he has a place for you. In other words, that we're, we're going to help you understand this even clear as we continue on. Uh, you see, after having experienced your life with you, because understand what Jesus Christ had done. He came in the flesh. He dwelt among men. And he is saying that now I have, I have the human experience. I've gone through the human experience. I know what it's like to be human. Because you understand, they say that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So it is saying that Jesus was on a learning curve through the things that he had gone through as being human. He is God who knows all things, but yet his experience had not taken him through the human experience. But now Jesus had the human experience, and he is saying, after having experienced life with you, now I know you by experience. He says, so therefore, I take what I've come to know, and I'm taking it to where I've come from to prepare a place for you. In other words, now there will be a place for man, sinful man, after having fallen and being restored to be placed in God. That's what he's really saying. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, we have to understand something in this. He is really saying beforehand, <clears throat> there was no place for you. There was no place for you. Before I came and I had the human experience before I came in body, before I came and, and lived among you, there was no place in God's economy for you because of your sinful state, because of the fact that you, as a human being, humanity had rebelled against God. He says, but I go now to prepare a place for you. He says, so that where I am, you may dwell there also. Now, I go to prepare a place for you where you fit in. After having the human experience, I go to prepare a place in the Father's economy. Now, now listen to it this way. I came, I became you for you. That's one way of looking at it. He says, I became one with you. The human experience, I became one with you. I became man so that as a man, now you fit into God's economy. I believe you have to go back into what Paul said in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, to really get a clear picture of what he's talking about. We talk about the place that God has prepared. He says in verse 19 of chapter 2 of Ephesians, he says, now therefore, you see, in other words, when it says now, it is saying beforehand, it was not so. But now therefore, now looking forward after something has occurred. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but now fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. This word, it mentions household, economy of God. He says, now you are members of the household of God. And he says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself 
being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fit, fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Now, now, now listen to what he's saying here. He is saying, I go to prepare a place for you to abide, but you become the place for God to abide. Listen to what he's saying. He is saying, so twofold, two things are happening here. You become the dwelling place of God while I, as I have gone to prepare a place for you. So in other words, now it's God in you, you in God, Christ, because Christ is in you, and you're in Christ because the Father and the Son are one. He says, so now, I'm making you fit. I'm bringing you to a place where you fit in perfectly into my economy. And, and, but you're built upon. He says, understand, you're part of the household of God. And now, we talk about the household of God, which means that it's all-inclusive. All that God rules and reigns over, you become a part of that. He says, but you're being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, but Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, you're, you're being built, but then he fits us together. We mentioned he builds a, he has a place for you, a place where you fit. You fit in God's economy, that which God had in mind before the foundation of the world. Can you imagine this? He places you in a position, a posture where you fit in perfectly in God's divine plan. Now, this is what he is saying. Now you're being built into a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. So the Spirit positions us so that we can fit perfectly together. So this is what he was really saying. Jesus Christ was saying, but we begin to see it emphasized through the Apostle Paul. So now, look at what the question was. The question that was asked by Philip was, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Reveal the Father to us. We want to see the Father. He says, and if we see the Father, that would be satisfactory to us. We would be satisfied if we could just see the Father. In other words, seeing the Father will complete us. We feel incomplete unless we see the Father. In other words, uh, if we see the Father, seeing the Father will fulfill the deepest longings within our heart and soul. You see, there is a longing that remains until we see the Father. The longing within our hearts. Now, now, now listen to this question here that Philip said, Philip requested Jesus. He says, Lord, show us the Father. He didn't say, Lord, show me the Father. He said, Lord, show us the Father. He saw himself as speaking on behalf of the others who were with him. Lord, show us the Father, because Philip apparently had already since had this sense of dissatisfaction that resides within his heart, within his being. He was saying, Lord, show us the Father, the deepest longing. And let me just help you understand this. He speaks on behalf because he was saying, identify with us. I believe that what's going on in me is going on in all of us. Now understand, let's begin to look at it uh, as I'm ministering to you. The deepest longing of the soul is to know our origin, is to know where we came from. It's to know origin. Where did I come from? What, where, what is my origin? Where did I originate from? That's one of the deepest longings of the heart. And the second longing is to know our purpose. One is to know where we came from. We begin to see in the day people are going back into studying their genealogies, and we understand going back into history and all of that because they want to know where they came from. But then the second, now that I'm here, what's my purpose? That's number two. What is my purpose? How did I get here? Now, why? Uh, that I'm here, why am I here? And then, now that I, if I can understand 
how I got here, why I'm here. Then the, the third one be, what am I supposed to be doing? Now that I'm, I know where I came from, I know why I'm here, now what do I supposed to be doing? You see, we're talking about origin, purpose, and meaning. Origin, purpose, and meaning, and it's all hidden in the Father. It's hidden in the Father because he understood something that contained within the Father is origin, purpose, meaning, so that people can be engaged or involved in their assignment. Because understand, from the Father, he's the one that gives direction for our lives. There are many who don't understand this, but because they were walking with Jesus, they had come to understand that Jesus Christ himself was the one that could give direction to their lives. Now, now, now I, I, I'm going to come back to understand this whole thing of show us the Father, but listen, to, I'm talking about us now. Now we look at the longing of the soul. Look at the longing that resides within the soul. There are many people that are right there today. I would say the majority of the people that, in fact, there was a time when all of us were there, where there was a longing of the soul, where you want more than you've already received. There's something that you want, but you can't figure out what it is. You, you've been there. All of us have been there. There's something missing. Uh, yeah, I have money. You might have money. You might, you might have uh, relationships. You may have uh, all the other things, family, all that. But, but there's something still lacking. There's something still missing within your life. And there's this deep longing within the soul uh, uh, that, that, that cannot be satisfied. And, and this sense of dissatisfaction, that's what uh, Philip was really expressing. And I was talking uh, the other day, I was having a conversation about this. We begin to hear it oftentimes in our music, in our music. And, and, and uh, this longing is, is pretty much a longing within the soul. And, 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 and what happens, African Americans, we call it soul music. And people call the music that we generate, the music that came from our human experience, we call it soul music. Now, soul music, oftentimes uh, we see soul, and we also see gospel soul music, music or, or, or gospel soul music. In that, uh, you, you begin to hear certain things, and for the most part, I'm not saying all songs are expressive of this, but oftentimes you begin to hear it as a result of distant lovers longing to be together. There's still something. It, 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 in, in, in love, you see, there's something still desirous that you want to attach to. And uh, I was watching a, a program the other day, and uh, it was about uh, getting choirs together, and a choir together that would be multicultural. And, and when I was watching all of this, I began to look at uh, one young man, one young woman rather in particular, who was a lesbian, and, and, and her heart, all oh, that girl could sing. She had one of the most beautiful voices you ever heard. But, but she began to sing the song, Jesus loves me, this I know. And she couldn't get the words out because as she would say just a few words, the words would, she would be overwhelmed even by just saying, Jesus, love me, this I know. It, it was really, when I began to watch, it, it, I was watching from this position, I said, she's really wanting to know that Jesus loves her. That was the whole thing. Does Jesus really love me? Does Jesus really love me? Am I accepted in the beloved? I would believe that her, her, her song in statement was really a question. Does he really love me? As it is with many others whose lives are not aligned with the will of God, they, be, they sing songs, but they're really longing for that song to become reality within their lives. Am I making sense? They're saying what, what need to be said are things that may be appropriate, but the longing is that what they're saying, what they're singing, they're longing for that to become reality within their lives. And oftentimes they substitute the song for the reality of the relationship. So now, look what it's saying. Longing to be, uh, as it is with distant lovers, longing to be together. You, you see, you love, you, you see, when, when you are distanced from one another, there's still a sense of satisfaction because you have seen, you have experienced something, or you know something is there, but you can't really grasp hold of it. And, 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 and as it is in, 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 in love without knowing, if the object of your love is interested in you. Have you ever been in love with somebody, but you didn't want to tell them? You didn't want them to, you, you, you never told them that you felt a particular way. I'm sure they, they call it puppy love, whatever they call it, but you fall for somebody and you don't tell them that, that you feel the certain way towards them. You, you see, I was that way with my 
uh, my wife, when I first met her, I said, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in her, but uh, I wonder if this is really uh, a two-way street here. Does she feel the same way that I feel? But watch what happens. So what I do, that's what I saw in this woman, this, this young lady singing. She was really saying, I, I, I really believe, based upon my understanding of love, that I love the Lord. But the question is, does he love me back? And if he really loved me, then why am I the way I am and think the way I think and the like? So, so is love without knowing if the object of your love is interested in you? But here's the good part about it. This still has to do with the awakening of the soul. The soul has been awakened. The soul has been awakened. The soul, the mind, the will, and the emotion. Because whenever you focus your attention on anybody besides yourself, it has a tendency to awaken the soul. So the awakening of the soul is awakening of a passions that are deeply rooted within the soul. So now it is saying that I can think of someone other than myself. I can think of someone other than myself. So that we begin to see the awakening of the soul. Now, now what you do with it is, 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 is still uh, yet to be determined, but we're just showing you what happens. We look at the dynamics of, of what people call loving another person or even thinking lovingly towards another. So now with this, I, I, I hear God's word, but yet there remains within me a sense of deep dissatisfaction. I'm still, I, I hear God, now, now we begin to hear it in church. We hear the word of God, those that are, uh, are we talk about music, but even preaching. Uh, you hear the Word of God, you hear preachers preaching, but yet in your heart of hearts you say, I, I'm still not satisfied, I, I'm not moved. Some people say, I'm not getting anything out of it. I'm not really, because you're not connecting. There's this sense of dissatisfaction. Now, now, now understand what is going on here. It is saying on your part, your definition of love is being expressed. You're stretching beyond yourself to consider another, but yet we begin to see there's no spiritual connectivity. There's no spiritual connectivity. So now what happens, going back to the song, the songs could be very meaningful and very, I would say, thought-provoking. It could be very moving where the soul is moved by what is being said or what, what is being conveyed through the song. The riffs and the, all the rhymes and the rhythms can, can be so impressive that, that it will cause your emotions to be overwhelmed. But yet, it could still, there still could remain the lack of spiritual connectivity. What do we mean by that? It means that only the spirit, we understand how we, we can say, oh, how I love Jesus, how I love Jesus because he first loved me, but only the spirit can bring us to the place where we're brought into that relationship, that need to exist between us and Christ, who brings us into the right relationship with the Father. So, so there has to be the spirit, spiritual connectivity. So, so now, here's what happens as we begin to look at uh, this whole thing. It, it, it says we begin to see the Word became. The Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. The Word became, uh, as I mentioned last week, E. Stanley Jones said the Word, be, the idea became fact. The idea became fact. So now we see the fact. So now the idea became fact, which brought about that connectivity because we were able to see one who was connected to the Father by way of the Spirit. But his objective was to bring them into that level of spiritual connectivity. Now, I'm saying in essence that the disciples had not arrived as of yet because the Spirit had not come as of yet. They had not arrived at that place of spiritual connectivity. Even though they had seen the signs, the wonders, the miracles, they had participated in things and all that, but yet they had not received the Spirit that would bring them into right relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. Only the Spirit can do that. So now, I like what uh, uh, Dr. Jones talked about. The Word, when we can look at the Word becoming fact, we hear the law, the law and the prophets. The law was the Word becoming Word. Moses spoke, and we see he gave the Ten Commandments, the law. So we begin to see the Word becoming Word the Word becoming Word. So we see what God requires based upon the Word becoming Word. He, he, he begins to reiterate, or he begins to 
uh, uh, bring to a place where we begin to see clearer what God's intentions are for our lives. But then we see the prophets. We begin to see the prophets and, and understand the Elijah and rest, but it's still the word, as Dr. Uh, uh, as Dr. St Jones calls it, the word still becoming word. It was still word. But in Christ now, the word became flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So now the soul searching of meaning, it is the soul searching for meaning which brings us beyond the search and brings the soul to the place of celebrating the communion that exists between the Father and the Son. We're brought to the place of spiritual communion, but that communion can only be brought forth through the relationship that exists between the Father and the Son. So now we see the Word becoming flesh, but not only did the Word become flesh, that Word dwelt among us. It's important to understand this. This is a very, I would say, a very poignant position in which I'm saying. You see, we talk about soulish expressions of enthusiasm, but born of conviction. When the word becomes flesh, then conviction comes, and commitment to God's standard of righteousness is, in fact, established. When the word becomes flesh, I'm saying when we flesh out the word, then it brings us to the place where we are brought to this place of conviction. We want what we see to be developed within us, and our commitment would be to a standard of righteousness, to God's standard of righteousness, because it becomes more than just word spoken, but now we have moved into this level of relationship. You see, expressions from heart, because without it, it can be expressions from the heart, but without a change of heart. You see, uh, uh, without it, it could be expressions of the heart without a change of heart. You, you say, well, did you mean what you were saying? Yes, I meant it. But I meant it based, but I meant it, but I've not been changed in order to live up to it. So that's what we're talking about. So we're talking about uh, uh, messages now that move people to the place of desiring to be righteous. Messages, songs that, uh, that, that are impressed upon the heart to bring people to the place where they're challenged and they're convicted so now they rely upon the Spirit to bring them to the place of righteousness. You see what I mean? So, so what happens, this is what he's saying, the Word becoming flesh and dwelt among us. So, so it's expressions from the heart where the heart is changed. It is, if it's not, it is merely a religious exercise when the words are contradictory to the lifestyle of the one speaking or singing. You see, what it does, it just becomes religious exercise. And I would venture to say it becomes entertainment. It becomes entertainment. People are entertained. Didn't you enjoy this particular thing? You see, what happens, that's when it becomes that religious. Religion, I mean by religious exercise, is something you do consistently, repeatedly. That's what religion is. It's something you do habitually. That's what religion really is. Good religion is when you develop good habits, and, and, and the reason behind those habits are solid. Now, there are too many who find solace in religious expressions yet void of spiritual intimacy. They find solace. They, they, their enjoyment is within these uh, religious expressions. They find uh, solace in that, you know, because now I must be right with God because I shout. I must be okay with God because I dance. I must be okay with God because I preach well. I must be okay with God because I sing well. And, and I'm going to tell you something. Many people are so impressed. Uh, we were talking the other day, uh, yesterday, my wife and I were talking about uh, some of the people that sing love ballads, and we're saying, uh, na uh, like, like uh, Natalie Cole and the others, they said they must be beautiful people to live with. They must really be romantics uh, because of the fact their songs are so, so, so smooth and easy, and, and they sound so romantic in their expressions. But, but then my wife was saying, that isn't necessarily so. Even though the songs that they sing are romantic, and the songs appear as if they are that particular way, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their character expresses the same thing that their songs express. So when we begin to look at those who, who perform well, sing well, preach well, and the, and the like, you see, what happens, we begin, many people are impressed with that, but yet it can still be void of spiritual intimacy. And here's what happens. 
As a result of that, people engage in redundant words and lyrics uh, attempting to convince themselves of their sincerity. They began to uh, try to move the crowd with, with, with uh, repeating the same thing over because, as we mentioned a young lady, I want this thing to be real to me. I want this thing to be real to me. So, so it still waters. So it's overworking what is produced from a dead spirit. And understand, it, it really, if you really look at it, it's, it, it is a mere abstract art form. That's what it becomes. It becomes an abstract art form because now you begin to see it, but it's left to the eyes of the person viewing it as to how they might interpret it. You know, so, so now we don't want to, and, and, and the reason I'm saying all of this is because we need to be at a place where we are able to distinguish the difference between love and infatuation. Between love and infatuation. There are many people who infatuated, they're infatuated by God, but they do not really love him. Now, infatuation has to do with imaginations taking hold and boasting. Uh, what happens when one is infatuated, infatuated rather, boasting uh, is the end result. They boast in their relationship. They boast in their abilities. They boast in, they take pride in even their, 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 their times of devotion. And you, you see, the Bible says, uh, uh, glory not, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the, the, the strong man in his strength, let not the rich man his riches. But if any man glory, let him grow glory in this, that he has understanding, that he understandeth and knoweth God and, and understand. And he doesn't share his, share his glory with another. So in other words, when you know him and you're in intimate relationship with him, he humbles us to bring us a place of, of, of humility so that we have nothing to boast of, as Paul would say, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. You glory in the cross. So now, infatuation, it is a result of fabrication of ideal relationships. That's what, that's what happens, infatuation. It is the fabrication of ideal relationships uh, where a person has, 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 has imagined or conjured up in his or her mind as to how the relationship ought to be. And there are many people that enter into relationships, but they're merely infatuated. Infatuations is, is, is uh, when it comes to spirituality, I call it hyper-spirituality. Because now that person that's infatuated will, will appear to go beyond what would be, uh, uh, let's say, a normal uh, relationship. Because he or she is trying to impress others that what he or she is saying or doing is real. It becomes pharisaical expressions. Develop, uh, developing judgmental habits because the person that is in this becomes judgmental of everybody else. You do not measure up to my standard. You, you see, that's when a person gets a place. You do not measure up to my standard. I, you see, in other words, hyper-spirituality, I'm on a level beyond the level that you're on. It's still that divisive type attitude of us and them. You need to be as I am. But, but true spirituality is humility, whereby you can appreciate any effort. God can appreciate any effort towards anyone that will begin to move in his direction. It's not saying that it satisfies the heart of God, but because of the fact that you are willing, then the objective is to help those who are moving in that direction to see Christ in a more perfect way. I'm going to get to that in the message here. See, we are going beyond surface relationships into true intimate relationships. Uh, because you have heard of him, you think that you know him. There are a lot of people that boast in the fact, you say, I met, I met, we were at a meeting recently, and I passed a person that's well known, uh, 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 Dr. Tony Evans, and we exchanged words for about five minutes. Now, I can boast of the fact, I know Dr. Tony Evans. No, I don't really know him. If you ask him what my name is, he wouldn't have the clue. If you ask me questions about him, I wouldn't have a clue how to answer it. But we passed each other, but we took pictures together. So I can show that picture around and say, look, this is my friend, Tony Evans. But he's not really that intimate with me. Why? Because we were just passing ships along the way. But here's what happens. You, you get to the place, there are people that, we talk about infatuations, they begin to uh, hype up whatever may be uh, uh, impressive to others. And it's really a display of their being unsettled. 
It's a display of being unsettled. You're not settled in the love. The Bible talks about being rooted and grounded in him. God's objective is to have us to be rooted and grounded in his love so that you're not questioning as to whether God loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, but you can sing it with sincerity and earnesty of heart. I know that the Lord loves me, that I am accepted in the beloved. So now that's when we're settled. So now let's go back to the question. Let's go back uh, to the question here. Uh, uh, we would see Jesus. I mean, uh, show us the Father, and it would satisfy us. Now we begin to see another group of people here in John chapter 12, verse 21. He says, sir, we wish to see Jesus. We wish to see Jesus. We wish to see him. We wish to, we, we've seen everything else, but the reason we came out was to see Jesus. Now we begin to see the word in flesh. We want to see the word in flesh. The question was, show us the Father. Let's go back to uh, Philip's request. Lord, show us the Father. Uh, the reason that he was saying it, because at that point, the Father had not been shown to us. Not, he didn't say, show us God. He didn't say, show us God. Because you understand, we understand God is invisible. God is all that he is. But he was saying, but I see a relationship established between you and the Father. You don't call him God. You call him Father. So, so what is this relationship that exists between you and Father? So now, Lord, bring us into that intimate relationship that exists between you and the Father. He was relationally speaking. He was relationally speaking. You heard the other teaching. We said that the Father, provisional God, the Father provides for us. Christ brings us into relationship with the Father so that the love of God, which is expressed through the Father and the Son, we receive it by way of the Holy Spirit. So now he is really saying, we wish to have the same relationship with the Father that you have. We want to enter into the same kind of relationship that you have with the Father. Here's how we put it here. Jesus, will you take us home with you so we can meet your dad? That's one way of saying it. Jesus, will you take us home with you so we can meet your dad? I want to meet your dad. Uh, uh, we had a situation. Uh, my daughter, when she was much younger, uh, she uh, made friends with a young lady, uh, Icy. And, and what happened, Icy's dad had uh, passed some time ago, and Icy was a, a daddy's girl. And my daughter, Karis, is a daddy's girl. And she said to Icy, she said, uh, I can just tell the way you act, you must be a daddy's girl. And Icy said, yes, I am. He said, but my daddy's no longer with us. And she said, that's all right. I'll share my daddy with you. I'll share my daddy with you. So she brought Icy among us, and then she shared the one that she loved as a daddy's girl with her best friend. But listen to this now. You know, one of her best friends. I better put it that way because she has several best friends. But, but, but here's the same thing was applied here. Lord, take us home with you so that you might share your daddy with us. We want you to share, we'd like for you to share your daddy with us. Uh, 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 Pastor Don, Dr. Don Thomas, uh, Minister Don Thomas, I don't know who he would call him, doctor, minister, whatever, but he did the same thing. I met Dr. Elliot Mason, who became my spiritual dad through Don Thomas sharing his spiritual dad with me, who I shared with several others, Earl Johnson and many others. But it is something, and you know, we like to have those exclusive relationships, and we say we got him all to ourselves. But let me tell you, love always shares. Love is always sharing. As I am loved, I want you to be loved as I am loved. So now the request was for a direct relationship with God as Father. But understand, he was making that request apart from knowing Jesus Christ. He was making that request apart from knowing Jesus Christ. You see, he wanted to be personally acquainted, personally related. He says, then if I had that kind of relationship, I would have what I need. We would 
have what we need. And he says, uh, then we would not need you to be so engaged in the activities of our lives. You wouldn't have to micromanage us. You wouldn't have to take us every step of the way in every particular thing that is done because we would have direct access to the Father and he could begin to show us what we need to see. But understand, he was saying, show us. I, I, I would say some disciples uh, would probably say, are you speaking for us or are you speaking for yourself? You see, he is saying that, he is saying, show us the Father. But Jesus began to say, have you been so long time with me? He began to personalize it and say, let me deal with you, not us, but you. But before we get to that, let's look at this request here. It was a, we see a picture is worth a thousand words. So to speak, a picture is worth a thousand words. Unless you're speaking of the living word. Unless you're speaking of the living word. What, the question would be, what does the father look like? What does he really look like? I would like to see his features. I would like to look into his eyes and gaze upon his countenance. There was another that had that request. His name was Moses. Moses made a request. He was saying, first of all, he said, Lord, show me your way. The Lord said, okay. Show me your way. I'll show you my path. I'll show you my direction. Then he went on. And he said, does that satisfy you? Lord, if it's okay, if I find favor in your sight, would you do this for me? Then he went a little step further. Okay, Lord, let me ask you another question. I want your presence to go with me. I want your presence to go with me. If I go where I'm going, I want your presence to be with me. Show me your power and your presence. I want your power to be exercised. I want your presence to be with me all, all the time. God said, okay, you can have that. But then he went a step further in Exodus 33, verse 17. He says, so the Lord said, he said, Lord, now, this is, so the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you've spoken, for you found grace in my sight, and I know you by your name. I know you by my, your name. And then he said, now he steps in there. He said, now, I'm, I'm being very easy as I ease up on these requests here. Then he says, and he said, please, Lord, show me your glory. Uh-oh, he stepped all the way in there. Lord, show me your glory. What is he saying? Lord, show me the finished product. Show me the finality of the mission completed and all that is accompanied in its completion. Show me all of it. I want to see the whole thing. I want to see everything that has to do with who you are and what you're all about. And understand, and then he said, he said, Lord, he said, Let, let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. He says, now, that's good enough. I, I will make all my goodness. When I'm saying God is good, the thing that he created in the beginning, God created, it was good. I will make all my goodness pass before you. Then I will proclaim, proclaim the name of the Lord before you. So you'll see my name, where my name is registered in all. It will be before you. And then he says, and not only that, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he also said, but wait a minute, Moses, you're asking a whole lot. But he said, you cannot see my face. You cannot see my features. You cannot gaze upon my face. He says, for no man shall see me and live. No man can gaze upon my face and I'm talking about the fullness of God, all that God is and live. You can see where I came from. You can see the reason that I had in, uh, for humanity. I'll show you all of that. But you cannot gaze upon my face because if you gaze upon my face, you will see the eternality of God. You will see where I came from, where I'm going, and what I'm doing, and where I'm going, and how everything will culminate within time and even in and throughout all history. You cannot gaze upon all of that because it's too much for a human to
to, to comprehend or to take in. And the Lord said, but I'll tell you what I'll do. Here's a place by me. I'll let you have a place next to me. He says, and when I place you next to me, and you shall stand on the rock, so it shall be while my glory, he says, show me your glory, I will let my glory pass by. I will put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll place you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. In other words, I'm going to let your request pass you by. And when your, when your request pass you by, what I will do, then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back. You shall see the, you will see where the glory uh, is going, and you will see the hinder part of the glory. But my face, you shall not be seen. Now watch what he's saying. And when he showed him that, then Moses began to write the Pentateuchs. Uh, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and the earth was our form and void. The darkness covered the face of the deep, and God said, all of those books that were written were registered because Moses received the revelation of where God came from and the ways of God, but not God in his eternality. But watch what happens. It doesn't stop there. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, it says, but, but understand, God says, Moses requests, I want to see your face. He says, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness in the beginning, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we see the humanity of God through the person of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm going to show you my glory, but my glory will be concealed within the person of Jesus Christ. Oh, we could just go there for a while to understand the concealed glory of Christ and how he revealed that glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. But it was concealed in the person of Jesus Christ. We saw the man, and the man was being rejected who actually brought forth the glory of God. We saw it in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, now, now understand this. This is what he has done. Can you stand the glory? Can you handle the glory? No man can see my face and live. Now, now, now look, look we, we, we're headed to the close now. Now, watch what he says. Go back to uh, understanding the request. The ninth verse of the 14th chapter of John. Let's look at the ninth verse. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you? Have I been with you so long? Have I spent all this time with you and yet, you have not known me, Philip. He didn't deal with the multitude. He didn't deal with the disciples. He dealt with, 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 with Philip. Have you been with me all this time and you still don't know me? He's speaking directly to Philip and not to those that Philip considered himself to represent. He said, is this your question or is this question a unilateral? Now understand what God does. It is progressive revelation of the Father. All the while, he was revealing the Father. That's why he says that, that, that if you see me, you've seen the Father. If you know me, you've known the Father. It was progressive revelation of the Father. Everything that Jesus did, everything that he said, was revealing the Father to them. They were seeing as much of the Father as they were uh, able to handle or to manage. You see, the willingness to manage what, uh, are you willing to manage what is being revealed to you? You're responsible for what has been made known to you. The Bible says, everyone to whom much is given, much is required. To whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. So, so what happens, can you handle the revelation that is coming your way? Can you manage what God desires to show you of himself? Now, look at 1 Corinthians 1.30, but, but in him, uh, uh, you are in Christ. In him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. It's written, we mentioned already about glory, and we glory in him. So now, the point that I want to make, I kind of jumped ahead, 
But I want you to see what the Lord did. The Lord says, he says, uh, Moses was saying, we want to see your glory. But then Jesus reveals the glory of God, the Father. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine. We mentioned out of darkness. He has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what happens in Christ, we see the light of the glory of God. We see the knowledge of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. It is concealed knowledge, and then we see the revealed knowledge. The more we see Christ, the more we see the Father. We see him. So the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us as the Christ of God. The Holy Spirit makes him known. So the tendency is often to rush the process. I want to see everything. I want to know it all. I want to know more than I'm willing to walk in. Wait a minute now. You're responsible for what's made known to you. See, a standard that I am, uh, am I willing to live up to that standard? See, he said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. Oh, if we had time. This is what he's saying here. He is saying that the belief that he is in the Father and the Father is in him positions you and postures us so that we might participate in the works of God. There would be no way for us to participate lest we believe that he is in the Father and the Father is in him. He says, for the sake of the works, for the continuation of the works, believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. You see, because what God is doing, how do we do the works of God? Believe, that's the work of God, to believe on him who is sent. Else believe for the sake of the works. So what happens, uh, he even says that uh, we begin to see further on, he says, if you love me, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. I, that's the part I'm going to have to handle next week. I will pray to the Father. I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper. Now, now, now understand what he's saying. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. If you engage in the work to which you've been assigned, if you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you, the Spirit of God, understand something about the Spirit. The Spirit of God that came on the earth because, you see, the same spirit in heaven is the spirit upon the earth. The spirit of God that led Jesus Christ while he was engaged in his earthly ministry now is a spirit that now dwells in heaven, but now he has the experience that he had, he had received through Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. So now what happens, the spirit that hovered over the face of the dark, now with the face of the deep, when God said, let there be, spirit operating, that was the Holy Spirit. Now the spirit has experienced life, but not just life, life in you, life, your life as being human. Now that's the spirit that sits on the right hand of the Father. And he says, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. He is really saying, I will send the Holy Spirit who, had, who possesses the experience, the human experience. I will send the Spirit to you so that the Spirit with the experience will lead you and guide you into all godly wisdom. Now, in other words, the Spirit with the knowledge of the human experience is there to lead you and guide you. And the Spirit who has knowledge not only of the human experience, but no your experience, the things that you're yet to experience, is a spirit that now abides within you. So now when we follow the spirit, the spirit can lead us because the spirit has knowledge of what lie ahead. 
The Spirit has knowledge of your purpose. The Spirit has knowledge of, of every plan that God has for your life. And the Spirit, understand now, when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, he is saying that the Spirit is preparing you for the place as the place is being prepared for you. The Lord gets us ready for the place while he gets the place ready for us. He says, so you say, well, why did I go through this? He said, there's a place for that question to be answered. There's a place for that experience to fit perfectly in. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're encountering, you understand there's a place for all of this to make sense. And it's not just a place that you visit, but he says, in my Father's house there are many dwelling, many mansions. It's not a place that you visit. It's, a place, it's the place of your abode. So in God's economy, nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. Every experience is taken into account. Everything that you go through in life, God says, I'll use that. You say, what about the things the devil does? God says, you understand, the devil cannot do anything unless I give him permission. And he says, but what I'll do, he meant it for evil. But when I get through with it, I'm going to weave it into my tapestry of love so that you will see the beauty of it all. The Spirit, uh, he said, I'm not leave you orphans. I can't get to that yet. I'm not leaving you as orphans, but I will come to you. That's the Spirit. He will take you and bring you to the place where things that are nonsense today will become sensible in your future. So thank you, Lord, for your spirit. Thank you for revealing Christ to us that we might see you, Father, for who you are. Yes, it was the request of Philip that we might know the Father, know you as Father. But then Jesus Christ brought us into right relationship so that we now can pray our Father who art in heaven. So I thank you for that. I thank you that now we don't just call you God, but we can say the God who created all things is now our Father. So we give you the honor, praise, and glory. And I pray for those who cannot call him Father as of yet, because not all can call him Father. It is only by way of your spirit that this will become the truth when they say Father. Many say it. They say Lord, Lord. And they say that Jesus is their Lord. And Jesus, when he's not their Lord, then you're not their Father. But the love that you have for us is to bring us into right relationship so that all of us can Say, Abba, Father. So, Lord, convict the hearts of those who may be rebellious today, those that are wayward, those that misinterpret love based upon their feelings and affections, based upon the solical whims that oftentimes dominate their lives. But my prayer today is that they'll come to the place of true love, not infatuation, but know what it means to love you with their whole hearts, their whole souls, and all their being. So we give you the honor, praise, and all the glory in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 I pray that you heard what God is saying and what God is saying to you because his objective is to bring each person into right relationship with him. The reason we say right relationship is because there's also the tendency of having the wrong relationship, as I said in the message, the wrong relationship, being infatuated, thinking and engaging in pre pretense, not really knowing what it means to enter into spiritual intimacy. But my prayer is that we'll understand what it means to be spirit-led, spirit-led. Those who are led by the Spirit become sons, sons of God because he takes his children and mature them. He grow them up so that they become sons. Sons, we're not talking uh, male or female. We're talking to, uh, whether you're male or female, we become uh, adults in the things of God. 
mature so that you can participate in what God is doing today and what God will be doing throughout all eternity. So if you're without purpose, you're without hope. But God's love is here to give you hope, to give you a future and a hope. So my prayer is that, uh, particularly for those who are hearing for the first time, you have to, many times, you have to renounce a lot of stuff that you might have heard in the past and things that might have clouded your view concerning Christ and those kinds of things because oftentimes it's a lot of religious expressions that are meaningless that cloud our minds from hearing the truth when the truth of God is being revealed. But when you hear the voice of God, the worst thing that could happen is that you harden your heart, you turn your back upon what God is saying based upon some prior experience. But hear the voice of God afresh so that he can come inside of your life and fill that void that exists within you. So if you're not saved, if you're not giving your heart to the Lord, let's pray a prayer together, but don't let this be the extent of it all because you need to be instructed. You need to be taught right. You need to be guided in the things of God. You need to hear spirit-led messages, spirit uh, sp uh, messages that, that generate from the spirit. And not only that, walking this thing out, how do you live our lives? Committing to a standard of righteousness so that you're not uh, reducing the standard or minimizing it to a level whereby it's accommodating to those who believe differently than those who believe on the Lord. So let's pray this together. So Father, I renounce all these things that are hidden within my life, those secret sins, as well as those things that I do uh, intentionally because I realize that these things are rebellious as expression of rebellion against you. Now I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead and that sacrifice was sufficient for me to be brought back into right relationship with you as a man or woman. So Lord, receive me as your child. Receive me as your own through your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I believe in my heart that the very power that raised him from the dead is the power that can change my life. So I give my life to Christ that I may become one of your children. And I thank you for the opportunity. In the mighty and master's name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And, and mind you, I'm not asking because some of you in other cities and other states and the like, we're not asking everyone to come to Cross Culture Church because we're not exclusive. We're not the only church in the world. We're not the only place you can receive the Word of God. But you need to be at a place where you're being taught rightly. You need to be at a place where you're being instructed in the things of God. Our objective is not about what we may look like in the eyes of others or how we might be impressive based upon numbers or the like. We are concerned about, I'm concerned about your well-being, that you get right with God and that you grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those that God will send our way, they'll come because they'll see uh, the, the, the benefit that can be derived from what they're receiving from this ministry. But then there are others who will see otherwise, but those that God will send our way, we open our arms to receive you as a part of this fellowship. And we commit our hearts our lives to you to minister the truth that you may grow in the things of God. So there's opportunity for you to be part if that's where God has placed this upon your heart. By all means, you'll see the information on the screen. By all means, let us know if you're uniting with this or de desire to unite with this ministry. We're here to love you into a, a deeper fellowship with Christ. Now, uh, if you've not received, we understand the Holy Spirit. He brings us into right relationship. But then Jesus baptizes us into the Holy Spirit. And those who have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, we want you to be baptized by Christ 
into the work, into the functionality of the Holy Spirit. So by all means, yes, you'll speak with other tongues. You'll glorify God. You'll uh, have the boldness and the wherewithal that's necessary to engage in the activities that God would have you engaged in. So if you've not received, by all means, get in touch with us so that we can share with you what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And those out of fellowship, come back. Because the enemy would love, especially those that's been enlightened, awakened, to believe otherwise and become a deterrent to others coming into the faith. You see, the, uh, the contradiction, the contradictory life becomes more, speaks loudly to those in the world because it's saying to those who are out there that is nothing to it. But come back to the Lord. And he can straighten you out. He can fix those things that's in your life that's in disarray. So we thank God for you. We praise God for what God has in store for you and what he will do in you as you yield your life to him. Amen. Let us now prepare hearts to give unto the Lord as he has provided for us. The God, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who is our provider, and our response is honoring him with our substance, with the first fruit of all of our increase, so that our bones may be filled with plenty and our vats will burst forth with new wine. Understand what God is doing as we're coming to the end of 2020, this year of vision. I'm going to tell you, it's been a year too. two. I would say that God is showing us many things that we otherwise would not have seen unless we had, we had gone through or is going through the things that we're suffering now. But at the same time, as we come to the end of this year, we want to honor God like never before through giving of our time, our talents, and our treasures. So as we prepare our tithe and offerings, thank you for your faithfulness to God. Thank you for those that have gone the extra mile uh, to see to it that ministry is provided, ministry goes forth. Thank you for those that supported the, the media ministry because we are on radio again, half our program, only once Sunday at 12 uh, noon, but at least we're back on the air again. Looking forward to the time where we can expand beyond that. But thank you for your faithfulness uh, to ministry for these things to occur. So let's prepare our hearts to give. And Father, speak to the hearts of your people. We thank you for them. Cover them and provide for those that have need. Because our desire is that those that hear the word will prosper in the word. And as a result of it, have a spirit of generosity so that the needs that are among them will be met as well as the needs of ministry. So we give you the honor, praise, and glory for all that you're doing in our lives as we take you seriously and take your word to heart, we thank you and we praise you in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God for you. And I trust that as a result of this message, you see God as Father. You see the Father in a way that you had not seen him before today. So as we depart from this place, let me just pray a prayer over you. And Father, my prayer is that you will bless your people, that you will surround them with your protection. And Lord, reveal to them things that they, the glory of Christ. So as a result of seeing the glory of Christ, they can gaze upon you with unveiled faces. Thank you, Lord, that what we're learning, we can, uh, we can apply. And it will make the difference in the lives of those all around us. May our witness be strong that other lives can benefit from the fruit of our lives. So in this, we give you the honor. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen, amen, and amen. God bless. And we'll see you Wednesday at 7 o'clock.